All right, so I'm going to do a deep dive. I watched this debate, the Muslim metaphysician versus Aaron Ra. Now, before I start, you know, I'm going to try to keep this video relatively short, uh, but I have a lot. There's a lot here. There's a lot to say. So if this video goes on long and I might not get to cover it all, you know, I might have to make two videos about this. Why? There's a really honestly a lot here. So let's start at the beginning. One day this is going to happen. Mark my words. You and the atheist community, one of these big public prominent atheists like an Aaron Ra is going to be in a debate watched by north of 50,000 people, a big public debate advertised that gets a whole huge audience and he's going to be completely annihilated in front of everybody. And it's going to be, I promise you, really traumatic for a lot of the people in the atheist community. Now, there's, there's different types of atheists. So for the atheists that I generally respect and I talk about a lot, they're, more, they're not about, they don't take this as a public contest. So they won't bother, it won't bother them. <laughs> it really won't. It's, they don't really watch, you know, what, what I'm saying is that somebody, a big public atheist, probably realistically Aaron Ra, why? Because it almost happened here, and I'll get to that in a bit. But he, some pu public atheist is going to be in a big public debate, and he's going to be completely annihilated in front of everybody, and it's going to be watched by more than 50,000 people, and it's going to be really traumatic for a whole bunch of people in the atheist community. Why is that? Because there are a lot of people in the atheist community who consider this, you know, public contest, and they're keeping score. And they're keeping score and they're playing teams and they're going to be traumatized. I, keep, I can prove it to you. And they're delicate little flowers. We can prove it to you. Okay. There's a couple of things that happen. These are just two I remember off the top of my head, which already traumatized the same type of atheist, a whole group of them. And these were like basically nothing. One of the things that happened, I kid you not, this actually happened. I promise you this is the truth. Emerson Green posted a tweet once and it said something like, who is a good example of a positive atheist? Now, what he meant was the colloquial definition of positive, like, you know, who's an upbeat person, who's an optimist, who's a positive influence on other human beings. That's what he meant. What a lot of atheists took him to mean was who is out there making a positive case for atheism, which is, you, which is as you may know, is trying to present atheists propositionally, like God does not exist here, let me show you how. And I swear to God, he got north of the whole atheist community melted down. He got north of 300 to 1,000 responses, and they were all like panic stricken. Ah, 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 they melted down over this one simple tweet that they misunderstood. Second thing that happened, that's one example. Second example that happened. What I'm trying to demonstrate is that there are a whole bunch of debate me bro style atheists usually. They act tough. They act tough against Stephanie. Stephanie's so dumb. Stephanie's so dumb. I'll debate you time. They act tough against Stephanie. That's it. <laughs> they don't act, they're not tough outside of that context. I swear to God, they melted down over a simple tweet. They're Fabergé eggs, basically, is what I'm trying to tell you. They're really delicate, pre precious little flowers. They're precious little flowers waiting to be exposed as, and they're going to be traumatized when a big public atheist gets annihilated, and it's coming. I promise you that day is coming. It almost happened. Um... The other thing that happened, uh, what was the other thing that happened? Oh, there was this, this atheist, I don't remember his exact name, I think it was Empirical Atheist. He was a fairly well-known atheist, not, not a big name, but you know, middling channel, probably bigger than mine, shut up, yeah, probably bigger than mine, whatever. Um, bigger than yours, Craig, and a lot better, okay, fine, fine. Um, I think his name was Empirical Atheist, he converted to Islam based off of the Kalam cosmological argument, I kid you not. And the Kalam cosmological argument, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the weakest of these, you know, arguments, philosophical arguments for God, and it converted him. And I swear to God, it, 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 it pre precipitated this three to 10 day meltdown of the atheist community, thousands of tweets, people freaking out, thousands upon thousands of tweets. So those are two pieces of evidence that there's a whole bunch of people in the atheist community who, first of all, have way too much invested in this emotionally. They consider it a public contest and they're delicate little flowers. <laughs> so when, when, when somebody gets taken down publicly, it's already happened to Christians. It used to happen a lot when I first entered the space, but it didn't count. Why? Because it was fundamentalist Christians. Aaron did it a few times to Kent Hovind. 
took them down. I hear them cackling, oh my God, we just annihilated Christianity. You didn't annihilate Christianity. You annihilated a fundamentalist Christianity. Can't be generalized towards Christianity in general. So it's irrelevant. That's why a lot of atheists to this day are still overconfident with how much ground they've gained. Why? Because they're only going off of these arguments where they beat fundamentalist Christians. Not a, not a challenge. And I've already explained why, so I won't go into it in this video. But again, as I said, this video may go on for a while. I may have to make two. Why? Because there's a lot here to talk about. So the Muslim metaphysician squares off against Aaron Ra. The person who most likely is the most likely candidate to be publicly annihilated for, and standing for the entire atheist community and be taken down, taken to task, and made to look totally ridiculous is probably Aaron Ra. Don't really think it could happen to Matt Dillahunty. Why? He's pretty circumspect. Matt Dillahunty, and I don't mean this as a comp comp compliment, is smart enough that there's not a lot of stuff that he actually asserts that he can get pinned on. So example that I've said in other videos, you ask him, Matt Dillahunty, are you philosophical naturalist? He probably is, but he'll never say that he is. He never commits to it. Why? Because he doesn't want to defend the position. So he's very, very careful to not have these stated positions because he doesn't want to defend them. Now, ultimately, I have criticisms about that approach. Why? Because it means you're not in this for truth-seeking. You're in this to score points and be a team player and win, which is ultimately not good enough. Ultimately not good enough. You've got to hold yourself to a higher standard. But that's a, that's a conversation for another day. That's not what this video is about. It's not going to be D Matt Dillahunty. He's too smart, too clever. So you're never going to catch him. Never going to catch him. It's probably going to be Aaron Ra, realistically. And this, this debate is a perfect example of why. First of all, it almost happened. Now, here's why there's a lot to say, and here's the subtext to this particular debate. Here's the backstory. There is this group of Muslims that the Muslim metaphysician is a, a member of. They call themselves Thought Adventure Podcast. Now, there are only two groups on YouTube that I, your humble apologist, have ever followed a lot of what they did. The Ortho Bros, Jay Dyer, Norwegian Noose, and you know, some of you saw this, this Pine Creek stream with Andrew Wilson and what's his name? Chase, I think, and I forget the other guy's name. There's Posh, there's a whole bunch of the underling guys. Those are the ortho bros. There's two groups whose work I, I won't say I did a deep dive into and studied, but I watched a lot of their videos and for the exact same reason. Why? Because they're really good at philosophy, they know their stuff, and I saw them win debates. That's Thought Adventure Podcast, The Muslims, who the Muslim metaphysician is a member of in good standing, and the ortho bros. The ortho bros, the, Muslim, the Muslims are interesting because realistically, and this is, kind of, this is kind of weird, but it's the truth, they lean towards Aristotelian arguments. Arguments like the contingency argument and probably the Kalam argument. I'm pretty sure they were the ones, my guess is they were the ones who converted that atheist. Why? Because they really know their stuff philosophically. And here's, here's the interesting thing. They already annihilated Aaron Ron. I kid you not, I promise. I kid you not. There's a really good video that I just recently rewatched because it came up as I was watching these videos. Steve McRae, three Muslims annihilate Aaron Ra. In those three Muslims is the Muslim metaphysician. What they present was the contingency argument. These guys are, I used to watch a lot of their videos. Why? They're really well grounded in philosophy. Really well grounded. They know their stuff. If you are new to philosophy and you don't know the arguments, you would be well served by watching them. Why? It's a really good introduction. Ultimately, I wound up getting a lot more out of the ortho bros. Why? Because the, differ the differences in the, uh, the Muslim metaphysicians know their stuff. They're really good in philosophy of mind. Really good in philosophy of mind. And they're good with the contingency and the Aristotelian type arguments. By the way, do you, are you one of those people who say they can't all be right, but they can all be wrong? Okay, those are Muslims. I'm a Christian. The contingency arguments are arguing for general theism. The arguments hold. They're transferable. They can't all be right, but they can all be wrong. We can both be right. We may be getting the details wrong, like I'm saying the Trinity, they say Trinity is incoherent, whatever they say about the Trinity, I have no idea. Trinity is incoherent. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. That's my Muslim. <laughs> I don't know what they say about the, the Trinity. Something, something wrong. Okay? Whatever. Doesn't matter. So we can get other details wrong, but the, the arguments that they present are transferable to general theism. They're, they're Aristotelian in origin. They're indistinguishable from a lot of the Thomist arguments. Ultimately, I think the Jay Dyer, the, the, those arguments are more influenced by Plato. 
They're about transcending categories, abstract objects, and they're more influenced by Immanuel Kant and justifications for knowledge claim. Ultimately, I think the Jay Dyer school of arguments is a lot stronger. That's why I started getting more influenced by them. But those, those Muslims, the Thought Adventure podcast guys, they know their stuff and they are good philosophers. And they're thorough. So you go watch. If you have never seen, the, the, it's, they, they basically annihilated Aaron Ra by presenting a version of the contingency argument. And it was like, it's like a master class in how to present an argument properly. They basically walk him to necessary truth. They get him to admit the necessary truths. They get him to admit off of his own paradigm of reality, his own worldview, necessary truths exist, and then they walk him right up to necessary being. And then by the time he's trapped by the logical implications of the argument, he's like, oh, wait, wait, no, I didn't make this, and tries to back out of it. I kid you not. I kid you not. They went through a lot. They covered a lot of ground with him. And they thoroughly undercut and annihilated a whole bunch of the stuff that he commonly asserts. Why? So what, what is my point? Why is Aaron Ra going to be taken down? Because he's ripe for the taking. Now, let's go to his opening statement. <laughs> he's ripe for the taking, guys. If you're a good philosopher, and if you're not a good philosopher, watch Thought Adventure Podcast. They'll get you up to speed. Why? They're good. They, I kid you not, they know their stuff. I used to watch them a lot. The ortho bros know their stuff, too. And the day is coming where uh, someone like Aaron Ra, who basically his epistemology, as evidenced by his opening statement in this video, is a mess. His opening statement is a, is the quality of the argumentation in his opening statement is absolutely dismal. That's why he is right for the taking. He asserts things basically out of his butt. You know, it's ironic because one of the things he says a lot in the actual debate is to, to, State as fact, something that, that you don't know to be the case is effectively lying. So by his own standard, he lies a lot in his opening statement. Why? Because he states a lot of things as fact that just aren't. Kid you not, starting with philosophy of mind, he states, and I don't know where he gets this from, but this is what he said at the beginning, okay, um, mind is emergent property of the brain. He doesn't say that as that's my philosophy in philosophy of mind. He states that as a fact. Every, all the neuroscientists, he literally said, caveats it with, pre prefaces it with, all the neuroscientists know that mind is an emergent property of the brain. Okay, it's not that simple. There may be neuroscientists who are physicalists, like Patricia Churchland, who assert that it's all brain, <laughs> that assert. And if you know anything about the hard problem of consciousness, and I've said this thousands of times, so I won't go into it, but... Emergent property of the mind being an emergent property of the brain is not an answer to the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness is not how did consciousness arise. It is in, the hard problem of consciousness can be stated as this. Phenomenal consciousness seems in principle irreducible to strictly physical properties. To say it is emergent property of the brain only tells you how it has arise. It doesn't tell you how it's actually happening at all. That's the hard problem. How is it happening at all? How are physical properties giving rise to phenomenal consciousness? To say emergent property of the brain is only telling us how it aris arose potentially. It's not answering it. It's not an answer. And he asserts it as fact, which is basically ridiculous. What, what does he think? I have no idea why, how he does it. He does this a lot. The second thing that he, he says is a basic assertion that's absurd is he says he's got this whole mess of an epistemology when he says, I want to see objective facts, no one ever shows me objective, empirically demonstrable facts. That's it. That's his epistemology. It's very, very, very close to logical positivism and scientism. He is basically both. Okay? And one of the things he says in this, he's, again, he asserts basically out of his butt, they, he said, philosophical arguments are not evidence. That's a, that's a common trope in the atheist community. It's idiotic. What on earth do you think an argument is? It is quite literally an attempt to evidence a proposition. Hello? What do you think an argument is? A philosophical argument is stronger than evidence. It's usually trying to what? Prove a proposition. Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. Therefore, it automatically and logically follows that Socrates is mortal. It is an attempt to evidence and, in fact, prove that proposition Socrates is mortal. How someone can say that's not evidence is ludicrous. Then he goes a step further and he says, all the philosophical arguments for God are an attempt to define God into existence. Now that can only be properly said about one philosophical argument for God. 
it's it could be, I'm not saying it's a valid criticism, but I'm saying for Anselm's ontological argument, that's potentially a valid criticism of that. You know, if, if an atheist wants to say that argument fails, why? Because it's an attempt to define God into existence. Okay, that makes sense in that context. I, it can be argued. That's the only argument that falls under that banner. Other than that, he's just, again, asserting something out of his butt that isn't true. Does this a lot. The next thing he asserts out of his butt in his opening statement that is not true at all. I don't even know what he could potentially be talking about. I don't even know what he thinks he means. Says, near-death experiences have all been debunked. What? By who? Where? <laughs> when did that happen? The neuroscientist told us near-death experiences don't happen. Near-death experiences are well-documented fact, Holmes. And if you don't believe me, look up Susan Blackmore. Who's that? An atheist who had a near-death experience. Technically, it was an out-of-body experience. But she goes around talking about it. There's an atheist who have called up the atheist experience. Atheist having near-death experiences. They're a well-documented fact. How, what, he thinks he, what on earth does he think he means by saying they obviously don't, don't happen, that's, they've been debunked? People go, he literally just asserts this ludicrous idea that people go assert, searching near-death experiences and they wind up deconverting because they, 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 they find there's no evidence. What on earth is he talking? I have no idea. What, does there, what on earth does he even think he means? I have no idea. But it's idiotic. Again, guy is ripe for the taking. He's ripe to be schooled and set straight. He's totally right for it. Why? Because he says all this ridiculous stuff that isn't true. And how he comes to those conclusions, I have no idea. Now, what you could probably say about near-death experience if you're trying to be charitable is some of the more outlandish claims about near-death experiences either have been debunked or, you know, are speculative at best. Like the guy floated above the room and... He saw something on the other side of the room that only could be seen if he's floating above the room. So the out-of-body experience, he had to be out of his body. Why? He saw this guy on the roof, and the only way he could have known this guy was on the roof was he was floating above the building. Something like that. Okay, those are the more outlandish claims of the near-death experience. You could probably say there's no evidence for those, or those have been, if you want to say those have been debunked, you know, fine, fair enough, maybe they have. But near-death experience is a common phenomenon across cultures. The only thing that's happened is that is, is, is it sometimes Christians don't delve into it. Why? Because it's, it's a little bit not evidence for the Christian God. Why? Because a Hindu dies and he, he doesn't see Jesus. Usually <laughs> he sees a Hindu. He sees, you know, the Muslim dies and probably sees Allah. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm pretty sure that's one of the, one of the problems with using them as evidence for Christianity is that, you know, people, people experience what it is in their subconscious mind that they think of as God. They don't experience Jesus necessarily. I'm pretty sure. Maybe that's what Aaron Ron meant. I don't know. He didn't clarify. Just assert something out of his butt. That isn't true. That isn't true. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of that he could have possibly meant. So what on earth is he talking about? No idea. Again, ripe for the takedown. The guy is ripe to be annihilated. They, they already annihilated him on the Thought Adventure podcast. Okay, but it wasn't seen by a lot of people. Had Muslim metaphysicians done the same thing to him here that they did there, this would have been traumatic for the atheists to watch. Why? Because their Aaron Ron would have been decimated. And a lot of the stuff that he asserts as his epistemology is standard atheist epistemology for debate me bro, not very sophisticated atheists. When they say, do you have any evidence? They mean only one thing, empirical evidence. They do say, arguments aren't evidence. Yes, they are, Holmes. What on earth do you think an argument is? Something people do just to pass the time, like play hearts or something? It's just like playing hearts, Craig. It's a game. <laughs> That's what I think Aaron Ra means. Just like playing cards. It's a game. No, it isn't. It's an attempt to establish by logic that a proposition is true. To evidence a proposition. What on earth do you think is going on? It shows you don't understand philosophy. And Aaron Ra doesn't understand philosophy. Doesn't even understand what's attempting to be done by philosophy. What is in the parameters of philosophy. A lot of scientismists are like this. Famous people. Uh, that's what I said. There's a lot to talk about here. There's really honestly got a lot to talk about. So I'm going to try to make this quick, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to. There's, what's his face? Neil deGrasse Tyson. I just watched his philosophy is useless thing on theory of everything. It was idiotic. The stuff he was saying was ridiculous. Ridiculous. Asserting things about philosophy, showing almost complete ignorance of how philosophy has actually been handmade into science over the years. Doesn't seem to know that at all. 
asserting things, basically, I won't go into it because it's too complicated to unpack and explain, but he goes, you know, would quantum mechanics basically debunk philosophy? No, it didn't. Quantum mechanics, if anything, debunked materialism, and it's really hard to find a philosophy. This is why there's different interpretations of quantum mechanics, which is what philosophy, that's it, philosophy, interpretive framework, that's a philosophical construct. That's why there are different interpretations of quantum mechanics that are vying for prominence. Those are different philosophies. The philosophy is the ultimate justification, the conceptual framework wherein this makes sense. And there's a reason why a prominent physicist like Carlo Rovelli started training himself as a philosopher. Why? Because he was saying quantum mechanics doesn't make any sense as framed. Maybe we have to readjust the way we think about the world, philosophically speaking. It's a very intelligent thing to do, very astute. Brilliant man, by the way. That's what quantum mechanics did. It ran up against the limits of physicalism. Why? Because it seems at, at first glance to decimate material, materialism. I've explained this in other videos, so I'll just say it briefly here. Prior to measurement, the, 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 the particle appears in a wave of probability. What, what, is, what is unusual about that? A probability hasn't occurred yet. So it seems, according to the physics, that the particle is not there until measured, is not actually there until measured, decimating any philosophical understanding of the universe prior to quantum mechanics. It doesn't decimate philosophy. It requires a new type of philosophy in order to comprehend it. And one of, the, one of the interpretations that I hold to, because I think it's legit, is uh, relational quantum mechanics, as I think it's totally legit. But anyways, that's for another day, other video. So getting back to the debate. So why didn't Aaron almost got taken down, almost got annihilated in this debate? As it was, it was a draw, and he lived to fight another day. Why? Okay, so the Muslim metaphysician was presenting an argument that's a little bit too vague, first of all. It was kind of a contingency argument, and it was kind of... There's another version of this argument being done as a precept by some of you may know James Anderson. He's a pretty good philosopher. He's been on uh, Capturing Christianity a few times. He's been on Revealed Apologetics a few times. He's been on that, that other thing, uh, Pensees, 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 Parker's Pensees. Is that what it's called? I think that's what it's called. He's been on that. I've seen him on a few streams. watched a lot of his streams. Why? Well, he's a good philosopher. He knows his stuff. He has been presenting an argument that's very similar to this. The crux of the argument, I'm not going to unpack it too fully, but the crux of the argument is propositions exist. Propositions basically point to a mind, mind of God. Now, there are stronger versions of this argument than what the Muslim metaphysician presented in this particular video. You could call it an argument from contingency. This is why I said there is no real category of presuppositional apologetics, because James Anderson calls it a presupp argument. See what I'm saying? Muslim metaphysician was presenting it as a contingency argument because he was trying to argue necessary, necessary truth. So that's part of why he didn't completely win. It was basically a draw. But in that draw, Aaron Ross said a lot of things that are basically indefensible. That's my point. Which means what? He's ripe for the taking. Indefensible. Asserts things out of his butt that can't be justified. He does it a lot. He does it a lot. You get a guy who's clear thinking, if you're an a ambitious philosophical type, you know, clear thinking presents a simple argument and you'll, you'll, you'll get him. One of the ways that he also, one of the things he did ahead of time, he used cheat codes, by the way. He did. He used cheat codes. So there was another part of the debate where Muslim metaphysician tried to get Anra to zero in on just the substance of what he was debating. And it could have been successful, but it wasn't clear where he was going, at least to me. If anybody watched the debate, it was clear what he was trying to accomplish, you know, you, you know and I don't, because I, it wasn't clear to me. He was trying to say, you know, you know, tr you, uh, you, there can be a truth that we don't know yet that we discover. Okay, that should be inarguable, but they were having a lot of trouble establishing that because Aaron Ra kept switching the thing that was being said. That's what he seemed to me he was trying to establish. That there are truths out there that we don't know yet. And Aaron Ra was distorting that to mean a whole bunch of different other things. And he was having trouble being led to that. Now, one of the things he did was he brought cheat codes. I'm almost positive he did this on purpose. I'm almost positive. I don't know this for a fact, but my educated guess is, is that he did this on purpose. Why? Because he knows that he got killed and annihilated. If you don't believe me, go watch Steve McRae's version Steve McRae's analysis is Steve McRae's analysis is better. It's shorter and it gets right to the point. It will help explain a lot of what's going on philosophically. 
He calls it literally free Muslims destroy Anra. Because that's literally what happened. Now Anra left that stream and he somewhat knows that that's what happened. So what does he do? He comes here when asked about what, are, are there necessary truths. He's got a weird gimmicky answer that he didn't have back then two years ago. Now he says, I don't even know what necessary truths mean. Well, you don't? <laughs> Come again? I don't even know what necessary truths mean. That's, that's his answer to this. I swear to God. So then Muslim metaphysician says, you know, the law of non-contradiction. He's like, well, quantum mechanics, I swear to God he says this, quantum mechanics has decimated the law of non-contradiction. What on earth does he think he means by that? I have no idea. There's a lot of things that Aaron Ross says that are so outlandish, imbecile assertions that they have some sort of predicate in something real, but they're really far away from the original idea. The only thing I can guess at at this is, yes, what I just said about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is mysterious, and it threw everybody because it, it showed us that the world that we actually inhabit is different than we expected it to be. Prior to the quantum era, almost every physicist would have said, would describe the world as a big clock. And, we were, and they would have said, we're right on the doorstep of understanding everything about cause and effect and, and, and determinism and how things operate, and we're right about to find it. It was quantum mechanics threw a monkey wrench in that because of the implications of the physics themselves. And 150 years later, nobody has any clear philosophical understanding of what the physics actually mean. There's a lot of good thought on it. There's a lot of good people out there. Carlo Rovelli is personally, I think, the best philosophically for understanding quantum mechanics. I think he's the best by far. But there's other people out there. I think David Lewis, there's a couple people who stream on this. Tim Maudlin, I think, is the other guys. I've watched all their stuff. Sean Carroll, I've watched, I've watched a lot of their stuff. But whatever Aaron Roth thinks he meant by quantum mechanics has showed us that the law of non-contradiction isn't true, I have no idea. There is the law of non there is a thing where some of the laws of logic have come under assault and potentially demonstrated to not be the case. And I'm pretty sure that is the law of non-contradiction, but that's not the context that Aaron Roth mentioned it in. So I don't know if that's what he meant. But for example, there is such a thing as a paradox, which is not a, a contradiction. So, as I said in another video, Craig Reed can be the greatest YouTuber of all time and also have these rinky-dink little videos that are practically a joke. It's a paradox. It's not a contradiction. It's a contradiction. No, it's a paradox. Greatest YouTube video of all time, greatest, but these rinky-dink little videos where he shouts and never gets to the point and says all this stupid stuff. But yet, they're the greatest arguments for God you've ever heard. Something like that. So, that's a paradox. Now, it could have easily been solved if Muslim metaphysician had seen this, this objection coming. He didn't. Why? Because Aaron Ross never, as far as I know, never brought this up before. I think he was trying to, to use a cheat code to get out of having to acknowledge necessary truth. Why? Because that's what got him into trouble in the, in the two years ago. He acknowledged that necessary truths exist, and then they used his acknowledgement that necessary truth exists to show him by his own logic that necessary being exists. Then he tries to backtrack out of necessary being. There are objections that could have been couched to their contingency argument. I'm not saying the contingency argument is great or slam dunk or proves God. It can, properly handled, walk an atheist to necessary being, and then they have to wrestle with the implications. That doesn't mean God. It just means this, this aspect of being itself is necessary. So there's a difference there. But what I think Aaron Rod did because then he says, okay, let's say two plus two equals four. Then all of a sudden he's found this mysterious mathematician. He goes, I'm not an expert, but this guy's an expert. And he said two plus two could equal five. Two plus two isn't a necessary truth. I kid you not, that was his argument. I'm not an expert, but this guy's an expert. Far be it from me to argue with the experts. Now, did that actually happen? Did he meet someone who was arguing two plus two could equal five? Maybe. Was that person a philosophical mathematician and expert? Maybe. If you've listened to my philosophy of math videos, this is one of the things I've told you in philosophy of math, that prior to Gödel's incompleteness theorem, now this is relatively complex, but this is what the mathematician potentially meant that he meant. Let's take Aaron Rodgers' word. Let's, 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 let's not assume that he's making that up, <laughs> and let's assume there was some mathematician. Okay, that mathematician isn't necessarily correct. What he did was, prior to Gödel's incompleteness theorem, the, the, the argument why math was in crisis is because, as I said, if you are relying on the formal logic of a system itself, which was formalism, math prior to Gödel's incompleteness theorem, you could literally prove a lie. 
like 2 plus 2 equals 5. Now, genuine mathematicians, philosophical, intelligent mathematicians, experts in the field, took that as evidence that something was wrong with formalism, that formalism was incomplete, ding, 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 hence Godel's incompleteness theorem, that if you are relying on the formal logic of a system, it is incomplete. Why? Because you could literally prove a lie. So that might be what he meant. That might be what some mathematician told him, that 2 plus 2 can equal 5 in certain contexts. That might have been something that that guy said. But this gets at something very important. Like I said, there's a lot to this, okay? I'm going to wrap this particular video up relatively soon and maybe make another one. But like I said, it gets at something really important. When expertise, expertise quote-unquote expertise, there's two things that expertise people do all the time, which means you can't necessarily trust them. One, they're just as capable of motivated reasoning as anybody else on earth. What that guy probably did is saw Aaron Ra got killed and said, hey, I'm an expert in mathematics. Here's a cheat code. Next time necessary truth comes up. I promise you that guy could have done that. And he was going off of something that is relatively abstract, probably not going to be able to be argued by the Thought Adventure podcast guys. Why? Because they wouldn't be able to see it coming. Giving Aaron Ra on purpose a cheat code. Giving him the ability to cheat. I... I that could easily have happened. That's the only explanation for a mathematician telling him 2 plus 2 can equal 5. Because it really can't. Goal's incompleteness debunked that idea. The only time I could ever think of that that would be true is when you are relying on the formal logic of a system. But that's what actual philosoph philosophically inclined mathematicians took as evidence that formalism was wrong. Because 2 plus 2 can't ge generally equal 5. You see what I'm saying? You see, the, you see the complexity here? It's hard to understand. I, I get that. It's very nuanced. But that's why Aaron Ra, but my guess is he uses Chico. The other thing that experts do, and you have to be careful of this because I've seen experts do this a lot. Two experts come to mind who are physicalists slash materialists. Sean Carroll and Patricia Churchland. Patricia Churchland did it on Aaron Ra's stream. Okay, she's a neuroscientist. I don't doubt her expertise when it comes to neuroscience. She probably knows a lot more about it than I do. But... That doesn't mean that any argument she makes that's related to philosophy of mind is going to be valid or correct. She can make an imbecile, stupid argument just like any other person on earth, and, and it's, not, it's not guaranteed by her expertise. She can make stupid points just like anybody else. She can have bad ideas about politics. She can have bad ideas about the weather. She can have bad ideas about raising a family. Her expertise in neuroscientists does not guarantee that the argument she makes makes any sense. And I'll give you the case in point because this is the argument she made against David Chalmers. This is literally her argument word for word. And it's not backed up by her being a neuroscientist. Oh, he's an idiot. Word for word, that was her argument. She didn't tell us why. He's an idiot. He's not a neuroscientist. That's her argument about David Chalmers. He's an idiot. He's not a neuroscientist. He's a philosopher. Again, the Aaron Ra is from a school where they have completely trashed philosophy. They, they say it's useless. They say it isn't necessary anymore. Why? Because we have, we have science. Science is so important. Aaron Ra is of that camp. He's a scientismist. That's why he is ripe for the taking philosophically. Why? Because he doesn't have any respect for philosophy. You can't expect him to understand it or get, get good at it if he doesn't have any respect for it. Ditto for Patricia Churchland. When she makes philosophical arguments, they're just as bad as when a YouTube atheist makes them. Why? Because she doesn't have any respect for philosophy. She's never trained it. She doesn't know it. She doesn't understand it. That's not neuroscience. It's not the same thing. So her argument about David Chalmers was imbecilic. Oh, he's an idiot. He's, a, he's not a neuroscientist. He's a philosopher. Therefore, he doesn't understand any of this stuff. That was her argument. Fallacious reasoning at its best. Sean Carroll's done the same thing. Sean Carroll once asserted, I heard him, and it made me mad, actually, because I have respect for Sean Carroll when it comes to physics. But when he gets out of his pay grade, he starts talking philosophy, he can talk out of his butt and be really, really not know what he's talking about. Really bad at it. He's gotten better over the years because he streams, he does that stream now where he gets a lot of philosophers on who challenge him to think more clearly about this stuff. But I heard a thing from way back when, six years ago, where he literally said, I can prove there's not a soul. I'm like, what on earth? What are you even saying that for? You cannot. Again, lying by Aaron's de Aaron Ra's definition of lying. No, he can't. And his, his logic was idiotic. It was like the logic of a fourth grader. When you die, your body shuts down completely, and there's no evidence of any activity at all in your brain or your heart. 
Therefore, there can't be a soul. Oh, gee, thanks for clearing that up. Every, all the rest of us, prior to you coming along, we all thought when you died that there was some evidence that you were still... I mean, it's the stupidest argument I've ever heard. It's like a fourth grade level argument. Literally, I made a similar argument when I was in fourth grade to my cousin about the Virgin Mary. I kid you not. I, it dawned on me as a fourth grader, well, she can't, be a, she can't have gotten pregnant if she's a virgin. Oh, the first person ever thought that, Greg. <laughs> so I went to my cousin. I swear to God, if there's God, this was God working on me and showing me I had no idea what I was talking about. Well, because I went to my cousin to, to present my argument. <laughs> Mary can't, the Virgin Mary couldn't have been a virgin. Why? Because she was pregnant. Virgins can't get pregnant. Hello? Where have you guys been? Is everyone asleep but me? That's a fourth grade. That's a fourth grader. They think they're the first person who discovered some idea hidden in plain sight. I must be a genius. I must be the most intelligent person ever. It makes complete sense. So I went to tell my, my, my cousin, who was a deeply committed Catholic. Okay, I kid this. This actually happened. I promise you this is a true story. I went to tell my cousin Mark Livrera. I'll even give you the names to prove it's a true story. I was in, it was in Norwood, Massachusetts. Working class Italian, Italian family. You know, deeply Catholic. And I went to tell him my revelation about the Virgin Mary. She can't be a virgin. Why? Because she was pregnant. Hello? Where, where you been, Mark? Did you get out of church, you tell me? And he goes, what? You don't understand the Immaculate Conception. I was in fourth grade. That was Immaculate Conception? What on earth is that? I had no idea what he's talking about. And he starts telling me about, you know, the, 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 he starts telling me, like, the theology. And I was like, wow. I was, like, mesmerized. I had no idea what he was talking about. I was like, wow, <laughs> like what on earth is, wow, I better shut up. I learned my lesson then and there. What, I better shut up. Don't present arguments when you have no idea what you're talking about. Why, because you're going to be made to look ridiculous at some point. He made me, made me feel stupid because he started bringing up the theology and I literally had an immaculate conception with two big words and I had no idea what either of them meant. I was in fourth grade. Immaculate conception, what's that? And he starts explaining it to me about how, you know, the Holy, the Holy Spirit impregnated in Mary supernaturally and he starts explaining theology and I was totally over my head. I was like, what? I was mesmerized. But I learned my lesson. What? Shut up. <laughs> if you don't know what you're talking about, keep your mouth shut. You can't just assert things out of your butt. Especially if you have expertise in one area, it doesn't transfer. Sean Carroll's argument about there not being a soul was an idiotic argument. Everybody noticed prior to Sean Carroll that when people die, they're actually dead. There's no life there. There's no physical heartbeat. There's no brain. There's nothing there. We think it happens supernaturally, Sean Carroll. Ugh. You have to prove that the supernatural doesn't exist at all. It's not a question of like, oh, we all thought that, you know, <laughs> that, that there was some sort of trick. <laughs> there was something still going on. Ridiculous. But that's what happens with motivated reasoning. Really, really intelligent people. Sean Carroll is a really smart guy. He's just as capable of motivated reasoning as anybody else on earth. That's why you can't trust the experts. Why? Because they'll, they'll cheat. They'll pretend that their expertise in this area transfers into this other area. Patricia Churchland, you went to study, sit with her on neuroscience and she probably knows everything there is to know. And you'd be really impressed with her knowledge and her expertise. But then when she makes a philosophical argument about David Chalmers, it's idiot land. Why? Because it doesn't transfer. The intelligence and the expertise in this one area doesn't transfer to the other area. I've heard other arguments that, that Sean Carroll make from philosophy that are stupid. Doesn't understand a lot of stuff about philosophy. He could get there, why, he's a smart guy. Aaron Rock could get there too. But as of right now, he is right for the taking. Why, because he's not motivated to learn about philosophy. He's motivated to assert that philosophical arguments, as, uh, as he said a few times, it's just trying to find God into existence. No, it isn't. As long as he thinks that, he's vulnerable. Why? Because he's never going to study these arguments well enough to, to get out of it. He's not, he's not really smart on his feet like Matt Dillahunty. Matt Dillahunty's really smart on his feet. He's impossible to trap. Aaron Ron's easy to trap. They trapped him. Throw an adventure podcast. They trapped him. They annihilated him. If that had happened in, in a big public debate where there's 50,000 people, that would have shaken the entire atheist community. I kid you not. I kid you not. That would have shaken the entire atheist community. It would have landed big. And it would have traumatized a lot of atheists because a lot of atheists out there are playing teams. They consider this a public contest. That's why they don't want to let go of... Uh, there's a lot I want to say. I think, I think I'll wrap this for... That's why they don't want to get... Let, that's why they don't want to participate in propositional atheism. Even though it's more clear what we're talking about. Because that's ultimately what we're discussing. God either exists or God does not exist. The I lack a belief is a personal justification. As I've explained in other videos, I'll explain this a lot. Why? Because people will start to really understand this. A personal justification is a lot less rigorous than an actual argument. 
in order for a personal justification to be valid, the only criteria is you have to be telling us the truth. That's it. And it is up to the person listening to fill it, to, 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 under, to, to, to come to, to figure out what the connection is. It's not up to the person telling the truth about their experience. Personal justification, I'm going to go into this in depth in things to come. Why? Because I think this is really valuable. Personal justifications are stronger than philosophical arguments. Why? Because they, they're from real life. They're what actually motivated somebody. So if, some, if I say to somebody, you're an atheist, and I say, why are you an atheist? You can literally answer me as a personal justification because my pastor was a hypocritical jerk. And there'll, there'll still be emotion there. I'll go, well, what's that got to do with whether God... I don't care, Craig. You should have heard the things he said to me. I had a kid. I brought my kid there. And he got in my face. And you'll, you'll hear real emotion. And another atheist who's leaning towards atheism or who is mad at his pastor will hear that and will respond what, to the truth of the story and will speak to him. And he'll go, yeah, that's exactly what happened to me. Personal justifications are really deep and really powerful and they don't have to be logically coherent. A doesn't have to equal A. It's up to the listener to make sense of it. As long as they're true, then the listener has to make of that what they will. Okay, well, that's got nothing to do with whether God exists or not, dude. That's not what he said. He said it's why he became an atheist. He didn't say it's why he doesn't believe in God. You understand the difference? A logical argument, and this is, atheists are going to struggle with this. Why? Because as they start moving over to propositional atheism, they're going to find that they're really hard to make good arguments for the proposition God does not exist. It's well nigh impossible. I happen to think that's because God does exist, and they'll give you a whole bunch of cheat code reasons. Oh, you can't prove a negative. Yes, you can. Can't prove a negative, Craig. Yes, you can. This <laughs> happens in theoretical physics all the time. God is not falsifiable. Yes, it is. The same person who tells you, God's not falsifiable, Craig. The, 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 the same per- Aaron Ronald probably say that. God's not falsifiable. Yes, it is. He will argue the logical problem of evil. Okay, that's an attempt to what? Falsify a God model. Hello? The attributes have to match the environment. That holds true of a God model. That holds true of anything out there. That's how you falsify Remember I said in other videos, and this is true, Russell's paradox is deeply misleading. Why? Because it is not an imaginary teacup out there in Alpha Centauri. So you can't prove that it's not there. Yes, you can. What's a teacup made out of? Teacups are not made out of nothing. They're, they're, if it's a real teacup, it's made out of what? Give me the name. What's it made out of? China. Okay, it's not there. Why? Because it wouldn't hold in the atmosphere. Well, this teacup's made out of porcelain. Okay, it's not there. Why? Because it wouldn't hold in the atmosphere. This teacup's made out of iron, Craig. Okay, same problem. It's not there. Why? Well, wouldn't hold in the atmosphere. Falsified all three of them. Why? Because it has to match the environment. The attributes have to be sustainable by the environment. It's the same thing with the logical problem of evil. What, what someone is trying to argue is that this world, as it currently occurs, is inconsistent with the God who is, you know, whatever the omni properties. You, you, everyone knows the argument. It is an attempt to what? Falsify God. If you could make that argument strong enough, you would falsify at least one iteration of, of, of a Christian God. Because the attributes have to what? Match the environment. The reason why atheists keep saying, making these cheat codes is to get out of the actual thing that they should do. God does not exist. Create an argument that proves that God does not exist and we can all go home. It's going to be well nigh impossible. I think that's because God does exist. But it's going to be well nigh impossible. And it's not because God, God isn't falsifiable. And it's not because you can't prove a negative. Both of those things are false. Russell's paradox, as I said, deeply misleading. I don't know how Russell got away with it. Why? Because it's really obvious. What I said is really obvious. Teacups are not made out of no- nothing. They're made out of a something. And that something can't be an Alpha Centauri. Why? Because the environment doesn't support it. It would disappear in the atmosphere. Float away. <laughs> Evaporate. Hello? <laughs> it's like saying, well, there could be a, 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 an astronaut floating around out there. No, the astronaut would have died and disappeared. <laughs> No, they can't be. The environment has to be able to support the attributes, the physical properties that you are asserting are there, or the properties that you're asserting, asserting are there. So anyways, the, uh, I'll wrap it up for now. I may come back to it. The day is coming where there's going to be a day where a big public atheist gets absolutely annihilated on philosophy in public. And it's gonna be traumatic for a lot of the atheists. It's probably gonna be Aaron Ra. I can't think of anybody else who would be. It's already happened to him once. It's happened to T-Jump, sort of, but he, he gets out of it. Why? Because he talks really fast, and he, there's, there's a lot of stuff that T-Jump asserts that is philosophically untenable. He kind of knows this. That's why he streamed with, like, uh, 
Dr. Uh, what's his face? A few times to try and correct his underlying core philosophy. Because that guy's an excellent philosopher. Dr. Richard Brown, I think his name is. He dropped a stream with him for like 10 hours straight. Done like four or five different streams where he's trying to correct him on some things on philosophy. It, it doesn't usually work. I don't know, T-Jump is really good at uh, doing something, getting something wrong and then like digging in and talking around it so quickly that you can't get at what, you can't get at the air. You can't ferret it out. So it can't happen to T-Jump. He's too quick on his feet. Can't happen to Matt Dillotone. He's too, too smart, too quick on his feet. The most likely candidate is Aaron Ra. And he ain't that sharp, he ain't that quick on his feet. He asserts a lot of things out of his butt that are unsustainable. He's ripe for the takedown. Somebody take him down, please. <laughs> why, why? Because half the atheists will go home. <laughs> half the atheists will go, you know what? I don't want that to happen to me. I better not do any more of this. That's what will probably happen. A lot of atheists came here because they saw Matt Dillahunty take down a theist. And they said, that's what I want to do. I want to beat up on someone in public and make it look like I'm super smart. Ah. Well, that's what Christopher Hitchens did. That's a, that's a huge motivation for why a lot of atheists are here. They don't care about atheism. They don't care about truth. They don't care about philosophical arguments. What they actually care about is trying to publicly humiliate someone and feel super smart. That's why they're here. I kid you not. That's just an educated guess. I could be wrong, but I'm almost positive that's, that's the case. Those are the debate me bros. Why? Because that's a huge chunk of what they do. They go around trying to humiliate people. They're intellectual bullies. They ain't that sharp. So they got to be careful. Why? Because the day's coming when they're going to get annihilated. They saw Matt Dillahunty intellectually humiliate someone and said, that's what I want to do. Or Christopher Hitchens. I want to be smart. I want to show how smart I want to flex on someone. That's, what, that's why they're here. Why? Because they don't care about atheism at all. They don't care about philosophy at all. They don't care about philosophy of religion. They don't care about arguments. They never do any investigative work outside of, you know, beating up on some knows our Christian on Twitter. That's it. That's the level of their investigation. That's all they do. That's all they do all day is look for Christians to, to beat up, metaphorically speaking. So, anyways... That's it. That is all for now, kids. Uh, go, go check it out. Muslim Metaphysician did not quite put it over the top. Why? Uh, the last thing I'll say about it, because then when he was trying, it wasn't clear what he was trying to do. He was trying to get Aaron Ra to admit that you, there's a truth that, you cannot, that cannot be expressed yet, a truth that we discover, hence it isn't vocalized. And then it wasn't clear where he was going to go with that. You know, the, the, his, his argument wasn't quite resolute and and honed out enough to be a slam dunk and put Aaron Ra away. When they, when they did the argument from contingency, they literally put Aaron Ra away. Why? Because it was like a case study. It was like a master class in how to present an argument. They just brick by brick, layer by layer, item by item, line by line, precept by precept. And they just walked him right up to necessary being, and then he tries to backtrack. Wait, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, ah. Still up there. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. The only question is going to be Muslims or Christians. <laughs> it's a race. It's a race to the finish line. Someone's going to get, someone's going to get him at some point and just decimate him in public. Why? He's right for the taking. The, the crap he says doesn't make any sense. And the only arguments that are valid are arguments against the standard, standard problem in the atheist community or arguments against fundamentalist Christianity. They're not arguments against Adam and Eve did exist. Who cares, dude? Okay, <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's Adam and Eve. That could possibly exist. Okay, what's that got to do with anything? Nothing. No Muslim metaphysician even said that right from the start. Okay, he made a whole bunch of assertions about the Bible. What's that got to do with the ontological status of God? Nothing. Zero. So they aren't arguments at all. He didn't make one argument in support of the proposition God does not exist. Can it be done? I don't know. Can he do it? I doubt it. Doubt it. It would be really challenging. And if the atheists properly start structuring it so that they start doing this correctly, they're going to find that a real struggle. And by your own admission, if you don't have supporting evidence for something, I want to proportion my beliefs to the evidence, proportion my account to the evidence, and you can't evidence the proposition God does not exist, you find it really hard to do, that should be some evidence that it isn't true. That's why a lot of atheists are scared to do it. Well, just try it. You'll find it well nigh impossible. And it ain't for the cheat code reasons, guys. It ain't because you can't prove a negative. Yes, you can. And it ain't because you can't falsify God. Yes, you can. It's probably because God exists. So if you try, and, you know, the smart set atheists, they've got their arguments, and I've already put out things saying why those arguments don't work either. So there you go, kids. And just for the last thing I'll say, the contingency arguments, those arguments from Aristotle, those are better than you think. They aren't great. They don't get you over the finish line. They don't prove God. They don't move, generally speaking, they don't move an atheist to God belief. 
but they're really, really, they've been around for hundreds of years. They have stood the test of time, which means they are stronger and better than you think if you're an atheist. Go watch Aaron Rod, go watch Steve's analysis of Aaron Rod gets taken down. Because he gives you, he also gives you the flaws in the contingency argument. That's why you should watch it. So, there you have it, kids. Uh, I guess I wrapped it up. It didn't take as bad. It wasn't as time-consuming as I thought. So, there you have it, kids. That's all for now. Mass has ended. Go in peace. Amen.